Thank you very much for signing on to our virtual seminar on the new Practice Direction 57 AC um, on the trial witness statements, um, the amendments to the, the focus on which those witness statements should be produced. I'm Jenny Seaman and Nick Hill is in the other window. So um, moving on to the next slide, our, our talk will be split into four main parts. We'll firstly cover the existing rules on witness statements, as this is what the new practice direction is going to be building upon. We'll then look at who and what drove the reform. We'll then cover in detail the new practice direction 57AC and its appendix and where this new practice direction applies, what kind of cases it covers. And finally, we'll finish with some practical points following the introduction of the new practice direction and we'll have a brief discussion about the, the working relationship between solicitors and barristers going forward and how we can work together to gather the evidence that's needed to filter into the new witness statements. So I just wanted to start with discussing exactly what witness statements for trial are and, and when, at what stage in the proceedings they, they come in. So the witness statements are usually exchanged after disclosure and before you have expert evidence. And as practitioners, I know we often fall into the habit of wanting to address everything we can in the witness statements. This is our first chance to add color to the pleadings and to show the other side how strong your factual case is. But the new practice direction is clamping down on lengthy and overly legalistic witness statements. The judges want to reduce the length of witness statements by focusing on the factual evidence that's in dispute that needs to be proved at trial. I attended a talk by the Chancellor of the High Court on Wednesday last week where he talked about um, the year going forward and what the focus is going to be uh, from High Court judges procedurally. And he talked a lot about this new practice direction and he said that witness statements now often go beyond what witnesses can say, which he says is a pretty dangerous thing. I also wanted to kind of point out that as we all recognize, especially during lockdown, most of what is done or said that is relevant to the issues in the case, the factual issues in the case is documented anyway in emails, texts, WhatsApp messages. And this more full disclosure is often more useful for judges trying to understand the factual basis of a case than looking at the witness evidence and hearing cross-examination. So given that, we're going to focus on the existing rules on witness statements, which is what the new practice direction builds on. The main provisions are contained in CPR rule 32 and the practice direction to that rule. So starting with CPR 32.1, this governs the court's power to control evidence. So the court can give directions as to the issues on which it requires evidence, the nature of the evidence on which it requires to decide those issues and the way in which that evidence is to be placed before the court. So the court anyway, at the moment has the power to limit the scope of witness statements and the evidence, but it often doesn't do this. And I think that's because the stage at which it would give those directions is at the CMC and that's pre-disclosure. So judges and the other side are often gonna be familiar with what kind of issues or evidence is gonna come up to and be in a position to give directions on controlling evidence at that stage. The next rule of the uh, rule 32 that's important is 32.21. And this is the general rule that any fact which needs to be proved by the evidence of a witness is to be proved at trial by their oral evidence given in public. Now, this is the general rule that um, the focus at trial and the, on the evidence that witnesses give should be oral. There's an exception which I'll come on to um, later in another provision of the CPR. But I also wanted to just quickly point out that this rule is reversed for part eight claims where there isn't a substantial issue of fact, which is why it's gone on the part eight track. Here in part eight claims, evidence at trial is normally in the form of a witness statement or affidavit, which is filed when the claim form is served. 
And um, there is a paragraph in the practice direction to part eight, which refers back to the rules on written evidence in part 32. So the scope of what witness statements should be um, required to cover for part eight claims should be the same as part seven claims. The next provision of the CPR is CPR 32.4. And this provides that a witness statement is a written statement signed by a person which contains the evidence which that person would be allowed to give orally. And the court will order a party to serve on the other parties any witness statement of the oral evidence which the party serving the statement intends to rely in relation to any issues of fact to be decided at trial. It just sets out that it, what the essence of the witness statement is. So it's a written statement in relation to any issues of fact to be decided at trial. The last section of the CPR I wanted to flag up is Rule 32.5. This states that if a party served a witness statement and he wants to rely at trial on the evidence of a witness who served that statement, he's got to call that witness to give evidence unless they put it in as hearsay evidence. And then this is the important bit, where a witness is called to give oral evidence, the witness statement should stand as their evidence in chief unless the court orders otherwise. And the court rarely invokes or exercises the power to order otherwise and ask a witness to give oral evidence in chief. And this provision of the CPR is meant to be for the purposes of reducing um, trial time to save a witness um, giving their oral evidence in chief. You just got the witness statement that stands as their evidence and then the other side comes in straight away with cross-examination. So these principles in Rule 32 are the core principles which the business and property court judges feel is, are being lost in the overly lawyered and lengthy witness statements that we currently see, which set out the arguments in the case and they deviate from the issues of fact which need to be proved by evidence at, at trial. And that's, that's what witness statements are meant to be centred on. There's also a practice direction accompanying CPR part 32. And at paragraphs 17 to 25 of that practice direction, there's detailed requirements as to the preparation and contents of witness statements, which I'm sure that you're all going to be familiar with. A few of the important ones. Paragraph 18.1, um, the witness statement's got to be in the witness's own words, it's got to be drafted in their own language and expressed in the first person. There's been a slight amendment from the 1st of April last year to paragraph 18.15, which is that a witness statement now has to stay the, state the process by which it's been prepared. So whether it's been uh, a face-to-face -face discussion over the telephone or through an interpreter. And that I think is the start of the focus on the process of how a witness statement has been obtained which is what the judge is also looking at to make an assessment of the value of that statement, its evidential weight in the case. The, the next requirement I wanted to highlight is in paragraph 18.2, the practice direction. Again, I think it's something you're all gonna be familiar with, but it's, um, you have to indicate in the statement which of these statements are made from the witness's own knowledge and which are matters of information or belief and then the source of any information or belief. The statement of truth has now been amended from the 1st of April last year. And that is contained within practice direction 32 at paragraph 20.2. It's also covered in uh, rule 22 of the CPR. So now the, wit uh, the statement of truth needs to say, not just that I believe the facts stated in this witness statement are true, but the witness also has to declare that he or she understands that the proceedings for contempt of court may be brought against anyone who makes or causes to be made a false statement in a document verified by a statement of truth without an honest belief in its truth. So this is a strengthening to the statement of truth. And then finally, paragraph 25.1 of the practice direction, it states that where a witness statement doesn't comply with part 32 or the practice direction, then the court may refuse to admit it as evidence or may refuse to allow the costs from its preparation. Alongside CPR 32 and the practice direction to that 
uh, rule, there are also various court guides that give further guidance as to how to prepare witness statements and what they should include. I'm going to focus on a couple that I think you'll be most familiar with. They're the Chancery Guide and the Commercial Court Guide. Now, the Chancery Guide, it gives um, further explanation about what a witness statement shouldn't include. So it says and it needs to be confined to the facts of which the witness can give evidence. And it's not, for example, the function of a witness statement to provide a commentary on the documents in the trial bundle, nor to set out quotations from such, from such documents, nor to engage in matters of argument, expressions of opinion or submissions about the issues, nor to make observations about the evidence of other witnesses. It says witness statements should not deal with other matters merely because they may arise in the course of the trial. It flags that the witness statement should be as concise as possible. And it also says that it's incumbent on solicitors and counsels not to allow the costs of the preparation of witness statements to be unnecessarily increased by over elaboration. Any unnecessary elaboration may be the subject of special orders as to costs. The commercial court guide has the same kind of material and guidance. Um, again, it should be co as concise as possible. You don't need to deal with matters that are common ground between the parties. You don't need to put in lengthy quotations from documents or exhibit documents to a witness statement. A witness statement shouldn't en engage in legal argument. And interestingly, this guidance only appears for commercial court cases. The current guide states that uh, unless the court otherwise directs, witness statements should be no more than 30 pages in length. Now, following the introduction of the new practice direction, 57 AC, I understand there's going to be a harmonisation of these court guides, in particular about what they say about factual witness statements for use at trials. And there is a proposal to drop this 30 page per witness statement word limit, uh, page limit found in the commercial court guide. So as you have seen, there are pretty prescriptive rules already on witness statement, on what witness statements should include but it's probably these rules are honoured more in their breach. I'm now going to hand over to Nick, who's going to talk about what drove the reforms leading to the new practice direction. Thank you very much, Jenny. So as is um, clear from what Jenny said, there's all, already a huge swathes of information in uh, part 32 and the practice direction to part 32 that should um, dictate compliance and how witness statements are produced. But it's perhaps well illustrated by an anecdote from one judge with the problem with witness statements we now have. He said that at the start of each trial, he takes uh, the skeleton argument, he takes a major piece of correspondence, that's a claim, that's a response, and he takes the key witness statement. And he said nine times out of 10, it's obvious who has actually drafted the witness statement. And that's at the heart of the concerns shared by commercial court judges. They say, and have said since 2017, that witness statements are ineffective in performing their core function of achieving the best evidence at proportionate cost at trial. And of course, these are not new concerns. As long ago as 2013, I put the Weatherspoon and Harris um, case on my first slide. That was a judgment of the then Chancellor Sir Terence Etherton, where a counsel for the defendant in that case had produced a witness statement in support of an application for summary judgment, where um, effectively they set out a long narrative for the documents, including lots of commentary in the documents, and when the judge queried this, said that you, can't, you can't you can't do this. This isn't the proper way to present your witness evidence. It's an abusive process, or it's abusive at the very least. They said, well, what can we do? We don't have a witness who was there at the time. We should be allowed to present our evidence in the way that we see fit. And uh, the chancellor was unimpressed by that approach. He said it was abusive. It was contrary to part 32, and indeed contrary to the chancery guide. So these are not new concerns. And the working group established in 2018 had identified five central concerns with the current production of evidence in chief. The first one is really elaborating on my, on my introductory point is that the process does not achieve the best evidence. And by that, I mean uh, the evidence which should be adduced and would be adduced if there was oral evidence in chief, which the working group described as a more genuine version of a witness's recollection. They said that the common experience of witnesses not coming up to proof uh, reflected the fact that evidence elicited orally in the courtroom was more reliable, uh, was uh, effectively more honest, a more genuine version, and much more likely not to sign up to something 
sorry, to say something that, they, that is different to what they would sign up to uh, in a pretrial statement. And of course, we see this in cross-examination as well. And that's why I put on the PCP Capital Partners and Barclays Bank case on my first slide. That was the um, fairly remarkable judgment of Miss Justice Waxman uh, last week or the week before last. And you'll recall that case stemmed out of the Barclays Capital raise in 2008 and uh, the advisory service agreements between Barclays and Qatar arising from that. And two Barclays executives gave evidence in the civil trial, having, of course, given evidence in criminal proceedings. And Miss Justice Waxman explained that that evidence in their witness statements was very carefully expressed, almost too carefully, he said. They came across as knowing very well the script to which they had to adhere. And once cross-examination moves to counterfactual, they both almost visibly relaxed and their evidence flowed more naturally. That, of course, is not really the evidence the court wants. The court doesn't want witnesses sticking to the script, their safety net of their witness statement. Uh, I also just flag up the unfortunate Mr. Forbes, who Miss Justice Waxman also singled out as being a generally hopeless witness. His witness statement was proved demonstrably wrong on a number of occasions. And what the working group really say, and it builds on what Jenny's already said, is that in these big commercial court trials, and indeed in the Chancery Division, in these large cases, witness statements go through multiple drafts. They go through perhaps a senior associate, through the partner, perhaps the junior counsel's involvement, and indeed perhaps with input from the SIL. The language is polished to within an inch of its life, and it becomes an aspirational version of the evidence the witness could really give. And the unvarnished version, which we be given in oral evidence in chief, is lost for the court. The second concern of the working group uh, is really a criticism of all of us. They say that the blunt point is that none of us trying commercial disputes now have experience of proper evidence in chief. They say that the proper and sensible scope of evidence in chief is no longer the stock in trade of those responsible for proofing witnesses. Now, I'm not sure that's quite fair, uh, because at least in, in our set, the first four or five years of practice, we get punted off uh, to the criminal courts. So we do, in fact, um, examine witnesses in chief. And indeed, in, in 2012, I remember uh, refusing to do something for my senior clerk and then being sent for three weeks to Glasgow Employment Tribunal, where then, at least, evidence in chief was still given orally. But nonetheless, it's probably a fair observation from the um, working group. The third point is perhaps the most obvious one, which is that the, the statements that are produced now often stray far beyond proper evidence in chief. And they include huge range of comments, commentary and narrative. Service and Frawley is just one example. There are numerous examples out there. That was all about a pizzeria in Cardiff. A judgment was on a judge, Keyes at QC, sitting as a um, high court judge. Uh, it's fair to say in that case, the judge was pretty unimpressed with all the witnesses. But he um, further pointed out that the draftsman in Mr. Frawley's statement uh, had done a bad job. 22 pages, 111 paragraphs, a great deal of comment and commentary. And the combined effect, the working group says, of those first three reasons, is at the time and cost saving of the current practice, and there should be a cost saving, we should be able to um, just listen to the evidence in chief and then get on with cross-examination is lost. Because what actually happens is that cross-examination becomes a process of needing to go through the 111 paragraphs of the witness and challenge each and every point for fear that in closing, your opposite number stands up and says, well, paragraph 96, uh, which is a borderline comment and probably shouldn't have been put in the statement, was not challenged by my learned friend, so our case is accepted. The fifth and final point the working group identified uh, was that the pre-trial process for witness statements had become too time-consuming and costly. Now, I think that's uh, a very fair comment, but frankly, the suggestion that the changes are going to reduce the time and cost spent on witness statements is um, nonsensical. If anything, this is going to further increase the time we spend and the money we spend in preparing these witness statements. Just before we move on to look at what we now require in 57AC, I want to flag up perhaps the best example of why we've now had this um, further practice direction passed. And it's the PJSC, Tatmef and Bogolibov case uh, from Mr. Justice Mulder, I think just last week again. This was a case, um, Tatnef are a company in Russia. It was a claim for damages uh, under the Russian civil code. I think it was just shy of 300 million US dollars. Eminent legal teams, very experienced counsel and solicitors on both sides. And counsel uh, for one of the parties got out of the witness that the statement had been prepared by his solicitor. And then there's this exchange in cross-examination recorded in the judgment, paragraph 170. Uh, question from counsel, this witness statement, which was drafted by lawyers, to what extent have you taken the time to check that it actually represents matters within your knowledge and represents your evidence? Witness, I can't answer to this. Question, you can't answer. 
witness, I don't even know how to answer this question. And I think this is the problem that judges have really had enough of. I, I think you can almost sum it up in one sentence, that the story gets better every time it's told. And that's what they want to avoid. They want to avoid the best evidence, not the best interpretation of the evidence. So by way of example, when I said earlier, I was sent to Glasgow Employment Tribunal for three weeks with evidence in chief. Actually, I was only sent for two weeks, but I've always thought that three weeks has a nicer ring to it. Now, of course, hopefully your witnesses aren't lying in the way that I just did. But that's really, I think, at the heart of these reforms. There are a whole host of issues considered by the working group, included um, harmonisation of the guides, imposing the 30 page limit from the commercial court guide and the chancery guide and the other guides and so on and so forth. Uh, pre-trial statements of facts, list of factual issues. But ultimately what we get is 57 AC and its new appendix. And you'll find it at page 63, schedule three to the 127th update to the CPR, rather um, reflecting the fact that civil litigation um, has got more complicated and reflecting the fact that more changes are made, the more costs generally increase. We're gonna look at these new uh, practice direction requirements and the statement of best practice in four loose parts. Jenny's gonna talk about when it applies, whether it's really anything beyond a restatement of part 32 that she's already taken us through. I'm gonna look at some of the new provisions, particularly on the list of documents and some parts of the statement of best practice and the most contentious areas. And when we've done that, we'll talk about our practical observations on the way forward. So at this point, I'm gonna pass back to Jenny. Thanks, Nick. I'm now gonna question the accuracy of anything you say. <laughs> um, I also just want to flag up my frustration with the fact that in order to find out what these new rules say, you've got to go to page 63 of a PDF document and find something called Practice Direction 57AC, but hopefully we'll get to grips with it soon. Um, so what claims does, does the new Practice Direction apply to? Um, it's to all witness statements for use at trials in the business and property courts. This covers new and existing proceedings, but only to trial witness statements, which are signed on or after uh, the 6th of April this year. Now trials mean a final trial hearing. So whether that's of all the issues in the case or just one or, or some of the particular issues in any of the business and property courts, whether that claim is being brought under the part seven procedure or part eight procedure. It also includes unfair prejudice petitions brought under section 994 of the Companies Act or contributory just and equitable winding up petitions under section 122 1G of the Insolvency Act. Now the business and property courts is this new umbrella term for all the um, courts that we'll be familiar with. So the commercial court, the old chancery division, which is now split up into the property trusts and probate list and the business list the technology and construction court and the insolvency and companies list, which was the old companies court. And physically that includes the Rolls building in London and the various uh, district registries, so Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, Cardiff, Bristol, Liverpool, and Newcastle. And the trial witness statements, that definition in the new practice direction also includes supplemental or reply witness statements where they've been allowed by the court. So what does it not cover? It doesn't cover affidavit evidence, although I don't think a judge would look too kindly on you trying to get out the rules by filing an affidavit rather than a witness statement. Um, it doesn't include or cover evidence in another witness statement, which isn't used for a trial. And this court still has power under part 32.1 to control, exclude or limit witness statement evidence anyway. So it's still got that overarching power. There are other further carve outs in paragraph one, three of the practice direction. I've set out these in detail on the slide. I'm just gonna discuss a couple because they'll be the ones that I think will most uh, often come up. So proceedings under CPR part 57 are not covered. This includes probate claims. So contentious probate, challenging a will on um, undue influence, lack of capacity, et cetera claims for rectification of wills, claims to substitute or remove a personal representative, claims under the 1975 Act and under the Guardianship Missing Persons Act and Presumption of Death Act, they're not covered by the new practice direction. I was trying to work out why that might be. There isn't any explanation in the 
um, implementation report or in the practice direction itself. And I think it's because there are in that um, part of the CPR specific directions about what the witness statements in some of these claims should include. So for example, you bring in a 1975 Act claim, um, the personal representative has to include certain information about the estate, the beneficiaries, who gets what. It's not really focusing on contentious issues of fact in the same way that a pure um, trial witness statement might do in a part seven claim. The other big exception to the new practice direction are proceedings brought under CPR part 64. And this is used when you're asking the court to determine any question arising in the administration of an estate or a trust, or you're asking a trustee to provide accounts, or you're asking for an order approving a sale or compromise of a, a trust asset, or you're applying under section 48 of the Administration of Justice Act, where you're asking the court to rely on the opinion of counsel as to the construction of a will or a trust and various charity proceedings. Again, there's no explanation as to why part 64 has been carved out, but I think it might also be because you've got certain provisions there. For example, looking at the practice direction to part 64B, um, where, which covers applications where you're asking the court for directions. There's provisions about what the trustee evidence, for example, must include to ensure you get any protection from the court. And I was thinking, I wonder what would happen if your claim that you're bringing before the court, say under part seven is, well, or even part eight, where you're asking the court for um, what is the proper construction of a trust deed under part 64, and then you're also asking the court to rectify the trust deed if they're not with you on your construction argument. The rectification claim will arguably fall outside of part 64 and within the scope of the new practice direction. So I think where you've got an element of your case which falls within the new practice direction, then the whole of the trial witness statement needs to comply with these rules. There's also been recent commentary from the chief master to the Pensions Litigation Committee, where he said that for part eight unopposed rectification claims, they might fall outside of the new practice direction, assuming they come within part 64 of the CPR. Now, I'm not sure they would come within part 64, but that's an argument for another day. But even if we assume that they do, the chief master said that the witness statements in those cases should be drafted to avoid each statement repeating and exhibiting the full document history. The focus of the statement should be on any specific individual recollect recollection the witness has regarding a particular draft or meeting. So again, there's the chief master saying that we need to comply with the spirit of the new practice direction, even if um, there's an argument that the claim may technically, technically fall outside of the scope. Now, looking at the wording of the new practice direction, uh, 57AC, it starts with um, recapping the purpose of what a witness statement is, which is links back to the rules that I've already discussed um, relating to CPR part 32. So it recaps that a witness statement sets out in writing the evidence in chief that a witness of fact would give if they were allowed to give oral evidence at trial. At paragraph 2.2 of the practice direction, it states a trial witness statement promotes the overriding objective by helping to put the parties on an equal footing, saves time at trial and promotes settlement. There's also further fundamental principles behind what witness statements should be focused on, which is highlighted in the appendix to the practice direction. So in the new rules, you've got the practice direction itself and then a separate appendix, which contains what's called the statement of best practice at, um, in relation to trial witness statements. And in that appendix, it states that a witness statement for trial does not require coverage of facts, which are common ground or adds nothing of subst substance to the disclosed documents. It states that the courts want a trial witness statement to focus on matters on which the witness has personal knowledge relevant to the issues of fact to be determined at trial. So the witness statement and the witness needs to talk about things they experienced with their primary senses. So what did they see? What did they hear? What did they touch? What did they taste? 
or focus on matters which are internal to their own mind. So what did they think about something in the past or why did they take a certain decision or an action? It can include evidence of things that were said to a witness if the fact that that thing that was said to the witness is relevant to the issues to be determined at trial or the truth of what was said to the witness is relevant and what was said to the witnesses to be relied on as hearsay. It also reminds us in paragraph 2.4 that the witness is giving an honest and personal account. The, the principles in the appendix to the practice direction also um, recap what evidence in chief should be about, because this is the focus. They want to bring witness statements back to what um, they should be, which is a replacement for evidence given in chief at a trial. And they said that evidence in chief is given without the use of leading questions. And when giving evidence in chief, the witness's memory can be refreshed by being shown a document, but only if the witness created or saw that document at the time. So they would know if the facts referred to in the document were accurate or not. Now, as you'll see, Nick, which Nick will come on to discuss, that's not going to be strictly a bar on what documents you can show to a witness when you're preparing a, a written witness statement. But it shows that there is a real focus on um, showing documents that the witness would have seen at the time. I'm going to pass back over to Nick, who's going to talk in more detail about what the contents of these new witness statements should be under the new practice direction. Thanks, Jenny. Just, just before I start, I'll note that there are lots, lots of questions coming up on the uh, question and answer function, lots on privilege and various other bits and pieces. We will try and pick those up as we work through, perhaps particularly when we come on to the practical points. The privilege point, I think, is a really interesting one. Uh, I'm going to come back to where we were in our talk, which is talk about the first major change, really, uh, in the new practice direction. It's paragraph 3.2 in the direction itself. And it now requires this list of documents that you must identify by list what documents, if any, the witness has referred to or been referred to for the purpose of providing the evidence set out in the trial witness statement. Now, this was the only uh, really major substantive new requirement set out by the working group that did not achieve uh, consensus from the working group as a whole. There was, we know from the implementation report, a substantial minority opinion against its inclusion. And it's supplemented by a paragraph 3.7 of the appendix in the Statement of Best Practice. And that requires that on important disputed matters of fact, a trial witness statement should, if practicable, state in the witness's own words how well they recall the matters addressed, and state whether and if so how and when their recollection has been refreshed by the document. Now, the arguments for and against uh, the list of documents are quite clear, and I think uh, helpful in, in um, informing us about what the court's really looking for. The arguments for uh, go along the lines of the court needs this clarity. The court wants to know how well a witness really remembers something. It shouldn't be a process of cross-examination trying to drag out from the witness whether this is reinterpretation uh, by reference to documents they never saw at the time, or this is actually their recollection from the time. And the implementation report is very clear that if you do show documents to a witness, you are leading that witness. So as Jenny has said, when evidence is being given, evidence in chief is being given other than in a witness statement. So in court, the um, practice direction is very clear that you cannot show the witness documents they did not see at the time. There's no absolute bar on this, but you need to do it now, recognizing that you are leading the witness. The implementation report goes on to say that the complex, fragile and malleable nature, and malleable is an interesting word, which I'll come back to, has been increasingly recognized in, in recent case law. So you need to wear kid gloves when you're dealing with your witnesses. As I've said, the implementation report suggests that you can still explore the quality and reliability of witnesses' memory, but prima facie, you should do that without showing the documents to the witnesses. And, and according to the working group, this is going to now encourage and demand proper discipline in the proofing process that apparently we've all been failing to comply with since uh, 1999. The arguments against are, are, I think, fairly obvious that the perceived benefits are outweighed by the, the costs of this. And that's not the cost of keeping a record of what documents a witness sees, because frankly, we should all do that anyway. It's the increased cost of um, putting together very subtle, very careful, very, very thoroughly considered witness interview plans for fear of, for example, adverse inferences being drawn. 
because you show lots and lots of documents to a witness and the other side then make a big deal of the point. And of course, it might be said that you're not leading the witness by showing them documents. You're reminding the witness of what was going on at the relevant time. You're taking them back five, 10, 15 years um, to help inform them, to help remind them of the various factors in play uh, when they're involved in the relevant decision making. So uh, just pausing there, this is going to make proofing witnesses more difficult and more subtle and certainly more delicate. We are gonna need more time and more care and more costs will be incurred in doing this. Uh, but I, I suppose what the judiciary would say in response is, well, we're not asking you to do anything new at all. We're just asking you to do properly what none of you have been doing uh, for the last 20 odd years. And it's quite hard to argue with that statement. Some of the other new requirements include the confirmation of compliance that the witness him or herself has to sign assessing out a new requirement alongside the statement of truth, which as Jenny has said, has been expanded. I think this is a good thing. I think this will help in those rare instances where you have a witness who's been very difficult, who is determined to insert huge swathes of commentary into their statement. In addition, and this is probably why we've had such high attendance at this talk today, we have the new legal representative's certificate of compliance uh, in the practice direction of paragraph 4.3. Now the working group's thinking about this is that would encourage witnesses and solicitors and barristers, no doubt, to focus on the relevant requirements without adding substantially to costs. And they also positively encourage uh, the judiciary to criticise the named legal representatives uh, if a certificate of compliance has been signed and the statement does not, in fact, fully comply. But again, I think this will probably be a helpful document. It will help us um, resist inappropriate commentary being added by difficult witnesses. The other point, just to flag briefly in passing, is about sanctions. Of course, the whole point of the new practice direction is really to prevent inappropriate and inadmissible content being adduced at all. Uh, removing and sanctioning such content is, as we all know, much more difficult. But the third and the fourth um, points, I think, are interesting. Because, of course, cost sanctions have always been available for inappropriate, abusive, inadmissible witness statements. But what the working group suggests is that at the PTR, the judge should take a quick look doesn't need to take, they say, a detailed look at all of the statements. And if a statement does not comply, it should be sanctioned. Now, that, that's a good idea in theory, but it's a difficult and unenviable task for a judge. But the short point is, if there are egregious breaches, like in the uh, tanf Bogolibov trial, they should be sanctioned quickly and, um, I think, fairly aggressively by the judiciary. The fourth point is perhaps the most interesting, and Jenny's already alluded to this, um, one of the sanctions will be, well, you can't provide a witness statement at all. They must give that evidence in chief orally. And I think there will be uh, genuine interest and encouragement from the judiciary, not just by way of a sanction, but generally speaking, that we should all think now more about whether we should call particular witnesses to give particular confined and, and defined areas of their evidence in chief in court. And I understand there's going to be a specific question in the case management information sheet for us all to think about. But so that leads us in the last 20 minutes or so to um, some practical observations and trying to answer some of the um, questions that are landing. I've got seven um, practical suggestions uh, that I've been thinking about for the last few days as we been preparing this talk uh, that I'm going to take you through. Some of them you may um, wholeheartedly disagree with, but these are, are my seven suggestions as a starting point. And the first one is obviously to start with the practice direction and the statement of best practice, but also start with Lord Justice Leggett. And in particular, go back to the nine paragraphs in Guessman and Credit Suisse from 2030. Now, I'm sure nearly everyone is familiar with that case, but there are these nine fairly astonishing paragraphs from him when a mere Mr. Justice Leggett about evidence based on recollection. He said back in 2013 that everyone knows that memory is fallible, but he did not believe that the legal system has sufficiently absorbed the lessons of a century of psychological research is the nature of memory and the unreliability of eyewitness testimony. He said that memories are fluid and malleable, the exact same word used by the uh, implementation report in 2020. He said memory studies have shown that memories are particularly vulnerable to being interfered with as the passage of time develops and they are shown, witnesses are shown documents they did not see before. And he has these two fairly striking paragraphs in 20 and 22 where he recognises the whole process of civil litigation, the whole process of proofing witnesses that certainly up until the 6th of April we've all been engaged in, um, influences and manipulates memories. 
when their memories have been refreshed by documents. It may well cause a witness's memory of events to be increasingly based on this material and the later interpretations of it, rather than the original experience of the events. So this is Mr. Justice Leggett in 2013. He says the best approach in a commercial case for the judge is to base factual findings on inferences drawn from the documentary evidence and known or probable facts. He says actually the only value really in oral testimony lies in the opportunity which cross-examination affords to subject the documentary record to critical scrutiny and to gauge the personality, motivations and working practices of a witness. And of course we know from uh, his um, Court of Appeal judgment on rectification and FSHC on some of his extrajudicial writing on good faith and commercial contracts that um, Lord Justice Leggett has thought very deeply about lots of these issues on his way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, so I think it's a, a useful point to start with him and think about how you would shape your evidence for him if he was going to be your trial judge. And so with that starting point in mind about where the documentary record is really used, my second practical suggestion is focus on the documents. Of course, you'll have a chronology as your starting point from when you produce your statements of case, but you need to expand that chronology uh, when you get disclosure. Now you need to stop, I think, very carefully about what is actually missing. Which parts of the documentary record are not sufficient for you to prove your case? Which parts can really be positively and helpfully added to by witness testimony? And then I think be quite brave when you've um, confronted those documents and think about what your witnesses can ignore. In fact, can you choose not to call a witness at all? Can you simply say, uh, well, we think Mr. Justice Leggett got it right back in 2013. We understand the confined nature of witness testimony going forward in accordance with Part 32 and 57 AC. We're not going to call any witnesses. We rely on the documentary record. And for that reason, brevity is my third point. And of course, here, all I'm actually doing is um, paraphrasing paragraph 3.6 or the statement of best practice. That is very clear that trial witness statements should not quote at any length from documents, seek to argue the case, take the court through the documents, and should not include any commentary. And all of that must now be done. And that takes me to my fourth point, which is focus on the important disputed matters of fact. Now, again, probably goes without saying, uh, but I come back to my second point. Once you've really worked out the documentary record, once you've really worked out what you've got to deal with, you need a laser-like focus on what oral testimony can actually add to that documentary record. There are sometimes one or two or perhaps 20 really important disputed matters of fact. Talk to your witnesses about them with open, non-leading questions. Find out if they can actually add anything, whether they don't remember them at all. If they don't remember them, then consider not calling them. You might be able to protect that witness from the perils of cross-examination by simply saying, well, they can't add anything. We rely on the documentary record. If you want to call the witness, you can do so, uh, but you're going to have to call them to give evidence in chief and we'll get to cross-examine. My fifth point is fear. Uh, and that's really reference to the expanded statement of truth, to the confirmation of compliance, and to the legal representative certificate of compliance. These are all really important documents. Uh, I think people are um, a bit scared of them, a bit alarmed by them. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think a bit of fear is really helpful. I think thinking very, very carefully about whether you can add anything to the documents uh, and still comply with the certificate of compliance is now crucial. And fear is no bad thing for that process. My, I've, just, I've just glanced over and seen one of the questions. Um, if an issue is taken about the witnesses refreshing themselves, read the documents, emails before the briefing session. Well, there's, it's very clear in the implementation report that if a witness does that for themselves, then they are leading themselves is the way the implementation report puts it. There's no bar on that as such, but you will still need to include in the list of documents the fact that the witness did that of their own volition. So there's no bar on it. You can do it, but you may be accused of leading, or rather the witness may be accused of leading themselves. Uh, my sixth point is all about language. Now, it's clear the judiciary are going to be really hot on new practice direction and really on part 32 going forward. And I think a really easy win, a really easy way of demonstrating compliance with new practice direction is through the use of language. And I put on my slide the Astera Trust case uh, from 2018. It's a decision of Mr. Justice Bancourt. It was an unfair, unfair prejudice petition. And at paragraph 90, uh, Mr. Justice Bancourt said this. He said, it's clear to me that the witness statements are the products of careful reconstruction of events and states of mind, based on meticulous examination of all the documents in the case by the large teams of lawyers 
involved. The true voices of the witnesses are notably lacking. The statements uh, provide superficially plausible reasons that are now advanced with the benefit of hindsight. So we have to embrace the language the witnesses actually use. Generally speaking, witnesses don't avert. They don't acquiesce. They don't say things like um, with respect, or if they do say with respect, they actually mean it with respect. Uh, they might use many more contractions that we would really like them to use. They might be blunter, certainly less subtle, but I think we have to embrace that. I think a, a really easy way of showing the court you're alive to what is now required with evidence in chief is to use their language. And it won't be as polished. It won't be as delicate. It won't tread the careful line you want to weave through the factual evidence to support your legal case. But I think the, the judiciary will recognize that it is fully compliant and have much more sympathy for factual case presented in that way. And that leads me to my seventh and final point before I hand over to Jenny, which is that I think this actually could uh, usher in quite a significant change to commercial trials. I think the way that witness evidence now um, sits within your case theory and your trial strategy is going to require even more thought and perhaps the thought it, it should have been given before these changes were brought about. We need to think about it really early in the process. We need to think about applying for oral evidence in chief. We need to think about really narrow, confined and defined witness statements. And hopefully it'll mean, so coming back to the PCP and Barclays Bank trial that I mentioned in one of my early slides, they were two really well-funded legal teams, eminent silks from the, the best sets. Uh, and there was this fairly striking, um, prior from the judgment, paragraph 674 from Mr. Justice Waxman, where he talks about the final 29 minutes of cross-examination of Amanda Stavely. He says, at the very end of cross-examination, characterised by Barclays as putting its case to her, but which had, at least in part, the appearance of a closing speech, it was just as her that she had invented it, effectively her case. He said, I received both oral and written submissions where this form of person the case was appropriate or even valid. Now, it's a pretty strong criticism of a fairly mild-mannered judge of a very, very experienced legal team. And they may have felt the need to, to put their case in that way because of the nature of the scope of the witness statement of that doesn't seem to reflect what the judge has said. But if a witness statement is properly confined and the court now robustly applies Part 32 and PD 57 AC with much more rigour, I think there'll be even less scope for closing speech defined or, or dressed up as a cross-examination. So actually we can better protect our witnesses, better protect our case and bolster our case, and hopefully give ourselves more time for opening and closing speeches in due course. And at that point, I'm gonna pass back uh, to Jenny, who's gonna talk a little bit about how we might work on both sides of the profession together to um, meet the requirements of part 57 AC. Thanks, Nick. So I think listening to the practical points that you've raised, there's obviously a need for proper involvement in lawyers in preparing the statement. No one's suggesting that a witness should go about drafting these by themselves, but we just need to make sure that the witness statement is not overly lawyered. The appendix to the new practice direction sets out a helpful guide as to what uh, solicitors should do when obtaining witness statement evidence for use at trials. So, I think going through almost like a checklist, I think the first thing to do is to explain to the witness that you uh, want to obtain evidence from exactly what a witness statement is designed to do. It's designed to replace the evidence they give uh, uh, as evidence in chief at trial. And they've got to focus on the matters of fact and issue of which they have personal knowledge. They don't argue the case in the statement and they don't take the court through the documents. The practice direction also suggests it's then helpful to show the witness the witness confirmation of compliance in paragraph 4.1 of the practice direction, which Nick's already discussed. And then ideally, there should be an interview between solicitors and the witness where the solicitor makes a detailed record of all the answers that the witness gives as fully and as accurately as possible, dated and retained by the solicitors. And in this interview, there should be the use of open questions and especially, well, in particular, no leading questions in relation to important contentious matters. And then the witness statement is drafted based on this note of the interview. If the witness statement isn't based on an interview, so for example, it's produced by written answers to a questionnaire or an exchange of emails, or it's drafted by the witness themselves, then this needs to be stated at the beginning of the statement. As I said, this was covered already in the practice direction 32 at paragraph 18.15.
And I'll come on to a question that we've um, been asked about privilege there, because I, I agree that raises some interesting points about what inroads can be made to challenge how statements have been prepared. The, um, the new appendix states that solic solicitors should assist the witness as to the structure, layout and scope of the statement and take and they can take primary responsibility for the drafting of it but the content can't go beyond the, the notes of the interview with the witness. And if after producing a first draft of the statement, it's clear that further evidence is needed to clarify a certain point, then this clarification needs to be done by asking the witness non-leading questions for the witness to answer in their own words. The guide states that it, it can't be done by solicitors um, suggesting a proposed form of words to fill in the gap for the witness to then sign off on. So how might this change the relationship between barristers and solicitors in gathering evidence and producing the witness statement? Will, will it change? I, I think counsel are often involved in settling witness statements and that's not gonna change following these new rules. But I understand that these news, new rules bring in a lot of change and it may possibly be the case that solicitors or clients want the want barristers to get more involved with the, the initial process of gathering and obtaining the ev evidence from the clients or other witnesses. I thought in this instance, it's worth highlighting some guidance that us as, as barristers um, have from the Bar Standards Board on investigating and collating evidence and taking witness statements, which was um, produced in October, 2019. And this guidance states that barristers have got a duty to the court and to act in the best interests of their clients. And they can't accept instructions to act if there's a real prospect of their independence not being maintained. And an example of where this might um, be is that if a barrister is appearing as an advocate for a, in a trial for a client, and they might also be called as a witness in that trial. So, and this raises questions about privilege. If there is an issue arising as to how um, evidence was collated or the circumstances in which something was investigated such that an issue might arise in the court trial where the barris barrister conducting that trial needs to give evidence on the investigation the barrister um, will be professionally embarrassed and if there's a risk of that then the, bar the bar standards board said that the onus is on the barrister to say at the start of um, being given a, a brief to conduct that hearing look I can't I can't do that because I might be called as a witness and I need to maintain my independence. So there's lots of questions for solicitors and barristers at the start of um, giving instructions in a case. If a solicitor wants a barrister to be involved in investigating and collecting the evidence, and there's a real risk that there may be an issue about that, possibly to do with the, the nature of the client or the kind of evidence that's involved or, um, I don't know, there could be a whole host of reasons why there might be a real risk that there may be an issue with the gathering of that evidence, then arguably that barrister shouldn't be given the brief to conduct the case in court, even if they're a junior in a bigger team. The Bar Standards Board has specifically stated that it's unacceptable for a, a brief to be given to a junior barrister if they're not in a position to take on the full advocacy role in that case if necessary. Possibly a way around this is to give a different junior barrister the role of um, investigating the factual evidence, uh, doing the interview with the witness, but I appreciate that will lead to more costs. It also involves an assessment of whether or not the investigation and collection of the evidence is likely to be challenged. Is there a real risk here? But as I said, it, it's quite clear that a barrister can settle and review a draft of the witness statement from the notes taken by um, the solicitor in an interview and then be brief to appear at trial. Jenny, just while you're on this subject, lots yeah. of, there's been about three or four questions which have a kind of common theme, which is to what yeah. extent do we think there are going to be more challenges now to the collection of evidence? And you're sort of touching on that um, subject area now. Do you think there will be challenges? Do you think there'll be attempts to pierce privilege of uh, the interview and the briefing process? Um, has anything really changed beyond the fact that there may be a bit more encouragement from the courts to do this, do you think? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about that. And, and I don't think this new practice direction can really make inroads into privilege. 
so the production of a witness statement is clearly going to be covered by litigation privilege. But I think what it's doing is possibly trusting us as practitioners to say, look, these are the rules you've got to follow when producing a witness statement. And this is what the courts are going to expect to see from now on. Um, if there is a statement which obviously doesn't comply with the new rules, then the other side might come up and say, well, how is this put together? And you'll be entitled to say, well, it's privileged. We can't tell you. But it's just going to look pretty, pretty crap if, you know, you, you don't have to go into the detail how, it's, how it was produced. But if you can't explain how it was, then the court's got the power to say, well, I'm not going to allow this witness statement to go in or you're going to, um, I'm going to give you a cost sanction, for example. Um, and so, I suppose, yeah. I, I suppose you would say that under um, practice operation part 32 already, the new 18.15, you need to be setting out how that statement was produced. So this is really building on what was already required and has been required for the last year. Yeah. But yeah. It, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't really give any inroads to Pierce privilege, does it? No. I mean, you don't have, exactly. You just need to set out the method for which it was produced, but you don't need to explain the detail as to, you know, what was said, or, you know, what was discussed. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think there'll be definitely cases testing the, how much of an inroad it makes into privilege. Um, so the, the final slide, I just wanted to finish with where this leads us for the future. Um, I think, ironically, it's going to involve more preparation to produce a shorter document, the witness statement. Um, there's going to be more judicial criticism of the process and new ground for the other side to challenge a witness statement until we all get familiar with the new procedure. I was wondering whether it would lead to possibly more applications for oral evidence in chief due to the fact that everyone's now more focused on what a witness statement should be and what, an evidence, what the evidence in chief is designed to achieve. Um, and I wanted to finish with the final point that I heard, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Chancellor speak last week. And um, he was saying that this new practice direction represents uh, a shift in approach as to where reforms are going in the business and property courts. And he mentioned that next in line is possibly statements of case. So the pleadings that get submitted at the start. He was saying that judges want there to be a, a massive reduction in the amount of argument that's now contained in the pleadings. There shouldn't be a reference to evidence of the case. There shouldn't be a reference to authorities, but just focusing on the kind of pure statements and the issues that you need to plead to advance your case. So that brings us to the end of our talk. Thank you very much for um, attending and for listening. We hope it's been helpful uh, to highlight these new changes that are gonna come in to play in about three weeks time. Now, there are quite a few questions. I, I've managed to go through the start of them um, whilst Nick was speaking. So I can, I can get some answers to those. I don't know if Nick, you wanna focus on the ones near, nearer the end? To the extent uh, we haven't covered them. Yeah, I mean, there's, there was an easy one I saw. To the new advice <laughs> the Admiralty Court, uh, no, they don't um, see paragraph 36 of the implementation report, which sets that out very clearly. The other okay. one, there was another easy answer to, I thought, Jenny, if you don't mind, I'll take that one first, <laughs> okay. is the one about, um, do you think that if you have a case where the terms of contract are an issue, but the terms are dealt with by a former employee, a witness who has no direct knowledge of the negotiations, but has been able to find, for example, email transmissions between the former employee and the other party, that it, this witness could still give evidence relying upon the contents of these documents. Uh, no, absolutely not. I think you're in Weatherspoon and Harris territory, um, Sir Terence Atherton in 2013, making very clear that that isn't appropriate, isn't the right approach for the way the witness should give evidence. And actually, you should go back and look at Desmond and uh, what uh, Mr. Justice Leggett, as he then was said, which is that rely on the, on the facts, um, produce the emails and get counsel to draw inferences from those emails. Those were two easy ones, Jenny. Sounds like you may have looked at some of the trickier ones at the start. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, question is asked, what does it mean that it, a witness statement must be in their own language if they have the mother tongue, which is not English, but speak English fluently, we're saying that they must provide a statement in their first language? Now, um, there isn't a specific practice direction uh, point on that, but I think if they speak English fluently and they're comfortable giving evidence in English, 
then they don't have to give witness statement in their mother tongue and then have it translated. It's just you'll get a sense from the witness as to how comfortable they are speaking in that language. Um, there's a question about, is this uh, just yet yeah, another example of ju judicial budgets being squeezed and the customary knee-jerk cost response from the bench and the Department of Justice blaming city lawyers for everything? Um, <laughs> possibly that's a cynical way of looking at it, but, but my sense, especially from hearing the Chancellor speak, and from reading the, the working group reports and the implementation reports leading up to the practice direction is that this is more than a cost saving um, drive. I think this is a real um, anger from the judges as to uh, witness statements not complying with what they essentially should be, which is you know, setting out the issues of fact that are personal to that witness. Um, and, and also the fact that it increases court time. I mean, all the problems that Nick mentioned, I think that is, that is deeply felt amongst judges. One, one of the other questions raised was, what about on receipt of the other side's disclosure? Can we show the documents to our client? What if the disclosure contains documents our client hasn't seen before? Well, of course you can show your witness um, that disclosure. You may want to, because it may fundamentally alter counsel's advice on point X, Y, or Z, but do it mindful of the fact that you may be leading the witness. Uh, you may, you will then have to include in the list of documents the fact you have shown witness X document Y, and that may be, may constitute leading the witness. So th this is why I say the suggestion this is gonna reduce costs and save time and um, not front load costs is nonsensical because decisions that otherwise would be very quick and straightforward are some interesting documents have come in, let's send them over to the clients, get their views on them, are now much more finely balanced. They will require further thought if he or she is going to be a key witness at trial. Yeah. Um, there's the question about where you'd expect the list of documents to appear. Now, from my perspective, I, it's probably neater to put it in as an appendix um, or as a separate document to the witness statement. Um, what, what do you think, Nick? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, I, don't, I don't really mind. I, I think you can go anywhere. Uh, I think in an appendix, but still covered by the statement of truth, is, is probably the right place for it to go. Much yeah. Um, it will depend on the particular witness, I suspect. Yeah. And we have a question about, can the opposing party request production of documents that appear in the list of documents that weren't disclosed? Um, yes, they would be able to. Yeah, and frankly... They, Unless they're privileged. But, they shouldn't be disclosed. Yeah, if yeah. they're privileged, they're privileged. But... If, if otherwise they're relevant and being referred to by a witness, then, then they yeah. should be yeah. Another question is, um, can witnesses be shown additional documents after the witness statement is completed and served and before trial? Something you might want to do to minimise the risk of the witness being ambushed at trial. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting question because one of the observations made by members of the working group about the undesirability of the list of documents was that we're all going to be now anxiously thinking what documents should we and shouldn't we show to our witnesses? And so you may decide not to show the witness anything that they didn't see at the relevant time. And then what will happen is they'll put their evidence in and in due course, they may see this document or be shown it in cross-examination. They may need to change that evidence. And that's, um, some members of the working group said, very undesirable. The pretty um, uh, blunt response from the other members of the working group are, is, well, that's a good thing. Witnesses um, should be willing to change their minds. They shouldn't be worried about not having seen documents, then needing to change their evidence, that shows actually they're just doing their best to assist the court. As to whether you might decide you need to show a particular witness, a particular document that they were not referred to when they produced their witness statement, it's gonna be a very finely balanced call. But if you do that, then I think you absolutely need to disclose that that has since been done following the production of the witness statement, because otherwise you're not really complying with the, um, at the very least, the spirit of the practice direction. Yeah. In my view. And do, do you agree, Jenny? Yeah, 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 that sounds sensible. Yeah. Um, there's another question. If a witness doesn't go through the documents in his or her witness statement, or there's no witness evidence, then should this be done in the skeleton argument or a separate new document? Um, oh, that's a really I, interesting question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think that um, it's kind of then the counsel and solicitor's team to go through the documents and to work out how best to present them to fit in with your legal argument. So that should be done in the skeleton. And then in oral submissions, there's probably there's going to be, yeah, a more of a focus on oral going through the documents orally. I think. 
But so what happens, um, to follow up on that question, in, say, a, a Part A um, disposal hearing about a trust, yeah. where, as we all know, you'd often have a witness who really, frankly, takes the judge in flagrant breach of Part 32 through a narrative of all the documents and sets it all out. Um, I mean, you can't do that now. So, so what are you going to do? You're going to send a kind of a list of factual issues to assist the other side. Are you going to have some sort of sort of quasi skeleton that you send? What, what do you think? How do how do you now best present it in advance of getting to the skeleton stage? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of discussion about that in the working group reports. That was a suggestion, um, and they said it's just going to be too time consuming to to do that and too costly to, to require yet another document. But the, the problem is, though, unless you have that. Um, you don't really have anything. You're going to have the, the paired back pleadings in accordance with um, Mr. Justice Flo and, and really short confined witness statements. So it's all a whole heap down. of disclosure. Yeah. And yeah. so it's all going to come down to skeletons. So the idea of an early mediation is going out the window, isn't it? Because you're not going to get close to that until you've seen skeletons. Yeah. Well, Sorry, possibly, that's, not, yeah. that's not a helpful comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, if, if there is a kind of desire to, to settle and to kind of really push your case home in advance of skeletons, then, yeah, you can send the other side a, you know, letter, detailed letter. You have pre-action letters, you know. Yeah, and that will be even fuller, I suppose. Mm. Um, uh, so there's some quite long questions. Uh, um, another question is, do we foresee more direction at CCMC stage to direct the parties and what that case actually is in order to focus witness statements to, the, to issues actually in dispute? Uh, yeah, I think that's in entirely possible. I mean, of course, you should already have a list of issues by the time you get to the CCMC. So um, you should be hoping to clarify and distill down the case. But we all know that lists of issues are often movable feasts until the first day of trial. I think the courts can be much less tolerant of that, particularly if there's witnesses X, Y, and Z who deal with points three, four, and five on the list of issues that have since fallen away. Um, I think it really is about focusing us all in on the real heart of the disputes in each particular case. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting question about um, the client or the witness reviewing disclosure in advance of preparing his or her evidence and their risk of them leading themselves mm. um, and kind of tainting their their memory um, I, I don't think you can avoid that you can't avoid a, a witness or a client reviewing the documents that I mean most people that are interested in their own case are going to want to do that but I think when you're interviewing them you've just got to make sure they really focus on the stuff that they can talk about from their own personal knowledge it's interesting isn't it because of course we all um, see um, document retention notices often go out really early in in proceedings to your own client base and whether you, we need to start thinking about um, making clear to witnesses that they shouldn't go digging for stuff um, necessarily because that may amount to leading themselves and may amount to their evidence being less persuasive eventually at trial. These are all the little subtleties of the new practice direction that we're going to have to think through and work through and are going to take two or three years I think to really um, get a proper feel for them and every case is going to be different but there are going to be some quite difficult decisions. Um, yeah. Another question is, how can a witness explain his understanding of the document without explaining the wording and sequence of the exchange of which it forms a part? Uh, well, it's obviously all fact sensitive and um, there may be cases where you do need to set out some of the narratives to put in context the actual evidence the witness can give in addition to the documentary record. But um, I think we're going to have to think really carefully each and every time you think you do need to include narrative because I think court's going to be much less sympathetic to that really being necessary for the witness to add to the documentary record. It, it's very difficult, in fairness. Yeah. Um, I think we'll probably take one last question, just given the time. Um, there's a question about if you've got an ongoing case in which the witness has already completed questionnaires, will you be required to state that these were completed in the witness statement or can you just follow the interview process? Um, I think it depends on what material you're going to use to produce the witness statement. And if you're going to rely on the questionnaires, then, yeah, you need to state in the witness statement how that was prepared and that you relied on questionnaires. Whereas if you're just going to go through the interviews, um, you can follow the process as set out in the appendix. Um, although there still is a requirement in 18.5, um, sorry, yeah, in the practice direction to part 32, 18.5, 
um, where you need to state how a statement was prepared. So I think there's, you're not going to be able to get around some explanation as, as to how um, the witness statement process came about. Just one um, very final question that uh, has amused me, Jenny. Uh, yeah. Isn't the issue after the trial has ended, the client has lost and they sued the lawyer for professional negligence, the court is going to see all the documents concerning the statement prep. And if a solicitor or barrister has signed off that certificate when it's patently untrue, that may give rise to regulatory action. Well, yes, that may well be the issue. Uh, you obviously want to avoid that issue. And of course, we all want to comply with the rules because if we're going to be signing our certificates of compliance, you need to be comfortable that you really have complied. Um, but you're absolutely right. That probably demonstrates why there has been so much interest in this subject, um, not just today, but all of the various talks and seminars I've, I've seen on it recently have been incredibly well attended. People are um, really quite nervous, is my impression, about the new requirements. I don't, for my part, I think that's warranted. I really do think this is a restatement of the requirements in part 32 with some bells and whistles, yeah. uh, but it's going to take some real care and thought as we take cases forward. I also think that if you focus on the fact that the witness statement is there to give um, the witness the opportunity to tell their own personal recollect recollection, what their truth of uh, the situation was, then I don't think you're going to be criticised for being professionally negligent if you've, you've retained the essence of, of that and you, you've produced a truthful document. Yeah. Yeah. They just didn't come up to proof. <laughs> Okay, well, um, thank you very much. And apologies, it, it's um, looking at the time, it's gone 15 minutes over, but there's obviously a lot of debate and um, a lot of issues that are being raised. But um, thank you very much. And if anyone's got any further questions, then feel free to email Nick or I on the um, addresses on the last slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you.